The years went by, and the years went by, bringing as they passed great changes to the two kingdoms. In Denmark, Hrothgar died and was howl laid, and Hrethric, his son, ruled in his place. Hygelac fell in an expedition against the Frisians, and Beowulf, still his chief thane, avenged him worthily on the enemy, and then, sore wounded himself, fought his way back to the seashore and the waiting war galleys, and so escaped to carry the sad tidings back to the queen. Heardred, the king's son, was still only a boy, too young to lead his people in war or guide them wisely in peace. And so the queen called together the counselors and foremost chieftains of the land, and with their consent offered the gold collar of kingship to Beowulf in his stead. But Beowulf, true to his house lord, would have nothing to say to this. And so Heardred, young as he was, was raised to the high seat with his mighty cousin to stand ever at his side as counselor and protector. Alas, it was to no avail, for in his young manhood Heardred fell in battle as his father had done. And this time, when the kingship was offered to him again, Beowulf took it, for he was the rightful next of kin, though he did so with a heavy heart. Long and gloriously he ruled, holding his people strongly and surely as in the hollow of his great sword hand. Fifty times the wild geese flew south in the autumn, fifty times the birch buds quickened in the spring, and the young men ran the war keels down from the sheds. In all that time Geatlin prospered as never before. But when the fiftieth year was over, a terror fell upon the land. And this was the way of it. Many hundreds of years before, a family of mighty warriors had gathered by inheritance and strength in war an immense store of treasure. Gold cups, crusted helmets, arm rings of earls and necklaces of queens, ancient swords and armor wrought with magic spells by the dwarf kind long ago. A great war of many battles had carried away all this kinsfolk, save one, and he, lonely and brooding on the fate of the precious things that he and his kin had gathered with such joy, when he should also have gone by that dark road, made ready a secret fastness that he knew of, a cave under the headland that men call the whale's nest. And there, little by little, he carried all his treasures and hid them by the sounding of the sea and made a death song over them as over slain warriors, lamenting for the thanes who would drink from the golden cups and wield the mighty swords no more, for the hearths grown cold and the harps fallen silent, and the halls abandoned to the foxes and the ravens. When the man died, the horde was forgotten, and lay unknown under the flank of the hill while the slow centuries went by, until at last a fire dragon, seeking a lair among the rocks, came upon the hidden entrance to the cave, and crawling within, found the treasure. Because he had found it, the fire drake thought it was his, and he loved it. Heavy armoring and jeweled dagger and gold wrought cup, and he flung his slithering coils about it and lay brooding over it for three hundred years. But at the end of that time, a man who had angered his chieftain in some way and was fleeing from his wrath also found the hidden entrance among the rocks in the golden hoard and the dragon sleeping. Now through all those three hundred years, the dragon had been slowly growing, until from snout to tail tip he was ten times as long as a man is tall. Yet still he was not long enough to completely encircle the mound of treasure. And between snout and tail tip as he lay was a gap just wide enough to let through a man. The fugitive saw the golden glimmer of the hoard, and even while his brain swam at the sight, it seemed to him there might be a way out of his desperate plight. 
Creeping between snout and tail tip of the sleeping dragon, he caught up a golden cup, one great cup glowing like the sun with which to buy off his chieftain's wrath. Clutching it to his breast, he fled back the way he had come. Presently, the fire drake woke and knew in the moment of his waking that he had been robbed. Blindly, in grief and fury, he snuffed about his beloved horde and knew by the smell that a man had been there. He crawled outside and padded about the entrance to the cave and among the rocks and found a man's footprints. And when the dusk came down, he spread his great wings and flew out in search of the thief. Night after night from that time forward, he flew out filled with hatred, seeking not only the thief, but to wreak vengeance on all men, because it was a man who had robbed him. Far and wide he flew, from coast to coast of Geatland, wrapped in his own fiery breath as though the mist of flame. Houses, men, trees, and cattle, even the king's hall itself, shriveled up as his angry breath blew upon it, and at each sunrise, when he returned to his lair, he left the trail of his night's flying marked in black and smoking desolation. Beowulf was old now, a gray warrior who had once been golden, but a warrior still. Also, he was the king, and for him in the last resort was the duty and privilege of dying for the life of his people. And so, as he had done so many times before, he made himself ready for battle. Well, he knew that he would not be able to come to grips with the dragon as he had done in his youth with Grendel the Night Stalker. For now he had to fight not only with strength but fire, and his familiar war gear would not serve him. For how long could a shield of linden wood withstand flame? So he sent for the warsmith to come to him in his sleeping quarters, now that the hall was no more than a blackened shell, and said to him, Forge me a shield of iron, strong to withstand fire, and be quick in the forging of it, or the people cannot endure many more such nights of desolation. And he chose twelve thanes of his own bodyguard, among them Wiglaf, grandson of Wagmund, who had sailed with him for Denmark, fifty roving seasons ago, and bade them to make ready to accompany him. There was a thirteenth of their company also, for the chieftain for whom the cup had been stolen had handed over the thief to Beowulf when he saw the evil the theft had caused. And to him Beowulf said, quietly terrible, You, and you alone of all living men, know in what place the terror that flies by night has his lair. And if you lead us to the spot, it may be that you shall continue among living men. Your chances shall be no better and no worse than those of my companions who come with me. But if you fail to lead us truly to the place, then you may escape the fire drake, but assuredly you shall not escape me. So, Next morning, the king put on his gray ring mail sark and sheathed at his side the ancient sword that had been his companion in every fight since Hrothgar gave it to him. And he took the heavy iron shield that was still warm from the anvil, and bidding the rest of his war host to follow on, he rode out with his twelve chosen thanes on his last adventure. The cave below the whale's nest was more than two days' ride from the royal village, but they pressed on with desperate speed, by dark as well as by day, and on the next morning, having left the weary horses behind them among the trees, they came over a wooded bridge and found themselves looking down upon what must once have been a fair and pleasant valley, dipping to low sea cliffs at one end, and at the other running up to meet the high moors where the bees droned along the heather bloom. 
It was blackened and desolate now, a landscape of despair, banged with the stumps of charred tree trunks. On the far side of the valley, the blunt turf slope of the nest upheaved itself and thrust its great head out to sea, and against the flank of the whale's nest the ground was tumbled and broken up into low cliffs and rocky outcrops, over which a faint smoke hung. The thief halted on the edge of the trees and pointed, trembling. There, down there, where the smoke curls among the rocks. That is where the fire drake has his lair and guards his treasure. I have brought you to the place as you bade me. There is no further use that you can have for such as I am. Be merciful as you are mighty, my lord Beowulf, and let me go. Beowulf glanced at him in scorn. Even as you say, I have no further use for such as you. Go where you will, your part is done. And when the man had scurried back into the woods, he seated himself on a fallen tree bowl to rest and gather strength, his elbows on his knees, his gaze going down into the valley. In sitting there, he felt weird touch him, like a shadow passing across the sun. He had been young and confident, glorying in his own strength when he fought in battle with Grendel, but now he was old, and he knew this would be his last fight, and suddenly lifting his head, he began, as the wild swans are said to do, to sing his own death song. I have lived a long life, and all since before I was seven summers old, I remember. He sang of his contest with Brecca, son of Beanston, Hygelac, his house lord, and the companions who had been his war boat's crew and sailed with him for Denmark, and the fights with Grendel and his dam. He sang of the death of Hygelac and the death of Heardred, and his own coming to kingship. The Frankish warrior who slew Hygelac, my king, him I slew with my naked hands even as I slew Grendel the Night Stalker. And with those words he sighed, and it seemed that all at once he had come to the end of his song. But this fight that waits for me now is a different thing, and I am old. Yet the battle power is not yet fallen away from me, and I am still the king. He looked about him at the warriors gathered on the wood shore, and slowly got to his feet, holding out his hand for the great iron shield. Wiglaf gave it to him, stammering in desperate eagerness. My king and my house lord, I beg you, let me come with you. Beowulf shook his head, but his eyes were kindly as he looked at the young warrior. Nay, nay, did I not say that I am the king? This is a fight not for a war host, but for one man, even as my fight with Grendel was for one man. But stay here, all of you, with your weapons ready, and watch to see how it goes with me down yonder. And he took up the heavy shield, and walked out from among them, out from among the charred trees, and down into the valley of desolation, his sword naked, in his hands.